of course, and it's based upon the graphic novel by Alan Moore and Eddie Campbell. Um, inspired, I would say, more so because the graphic novel unto itself there's really no way to do justice to it. And there are two different mediums. You have a two hour movie as opposed to whatever, 500 page, uh, multi-layered, very complex graphic novel. So we've taken basically the smell of the novel, the theory and the title, and we've kind of spun our own little web and done things that make it uh, its own, um, entity basically. And which makes it interesting to us as filmmakers is not to copy something to, you know, word for word, but to, uh, make it its own because it is an entirely different medium. The original graphic novel is very much uh, Jack the Ripper, Portrait of a Serial Killer. By page 30, you know this guy is Jack. He's been sent into a mission. And the graphic novel is about his journey into madness. I don't think Abilene shows up in the graphic novel to probably page 150. So the graphic novel, as I said before, is more of a meditation on evil, a meditation on how it comes about, and a meditation on madness. You watch as Jack slowly gets into this. The first one, he doesn't really, it's work, he has to do it. The second one, well, that's, you know, by the time he finds out that he's not done with the fourth one, there's still one more to go, he's completely gone. He's completely, you know, bonkers, he's completely gone mad. And, uh, you know, if you study the case, which like Alan did, it's very clear. By the time you get to the fifth one, you know, it was almost like someone someone was out to get the fifth one because instead of just slitting her throat or something, he disassembled the person. If you're going to go make a studio film, there's just no way you're going to convince the studio that Jack is the main character. You know, it would be very fascinating. It would be very interesting to watch Jack. But that's not a popular commercial film. And there was never, ever a discussion. I mean... You know, as I got to become friendly with Alan Moore and hang out, hang out with him and talk to him, it's like you understand that this is immediately going into Abilene's story. It's really going to be about the guy who we, as an audience, are going to you know, Johnny Depp in the film. We're going to follow. And although Jack should be prominent, Jack should be a major character. It's not Jack's story; it's Abilene's story, and that's that's the major departure. Came across a graphic novel after we had read the script. And somebody had gave us the comic book. And then we started reading the comic book and figuring out what to put back into the script because the original script we had gotten from Disney had a really like Hollywood type ending. There was nothing from the comic book in it, it was just the basis. And what most people don't know is that the comic book was based after a book called Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution, written by Stephen Knight in nineteen seventy six, I think. And that's you know, that's the story right there. And then the comic book deviated from that and created its own story, but a lot of it was based after that. And then we did the same thing with the movie. So what I did with the movie, or what both me and brother did was go back to the original book, read that book, then read other source material, and then in conjunction with the comic book, come up with you know like a, a composite of all of them, and also all the movies that had been put out before, like all the best aspects of those movies we used too, and try to make like try to make a definitive Jack Ripper movie, even though no way knows who. Who, who, who did it? Every one of the actors. I got to a point where it was so ridiculous. Every every one of the actors and production people got the graphic novel. At the time they were in ten different individual parts. So every time, I mean, I, I ended up not having copies because I was giving them even actors to me with it didn't eventually be in the movie. We we're just giving them out to everyone, and then they can they compiled and put them in one book. And so every department um had had the novel, and everybody knew we marked all the you know, as far as production design or look at some people's faces or whatever that we, we want to extract from the graphic novel. So I'd say everyone involved, from even from the smallest part, you got a graphic novel. I think that we definitely use a comic book for, you know, production design or attire for the actors. And when you're dealing with different departments like that, they look at them for different reasons. Like production design, they say, well, look at the way they set look in a comic book. camera and say, oh, look how dark the clouds are right here, or the way this coach looks in this shot. And for the actors, it was just great um, character study, you know, because it's so rich in detail. There's no way that you can spend two hours on that small character that we have in the movie, but they can read the comic book and find all this information out and know, know how to go about it if they want to use that, basically. So everybody did eventually end up reading the comic book. The one thing we took from the comic book that really helped us out was more of the 
images, you know, the visuals. We took certain frames and stuff like that that inspired certain scenes. There was certain dialogue we took to um, that stuck really, uh, you know, true to the, the way it was in the comic book. There was a conversation scene at the end with the Masons that was the exact dialogue from the comic book. And before that, it was, a, it was the same scene, but the dialogue wasn't exactly the same. We didn't like the dialogue, so we changed it to the comic book. Sometimes you take dialogue from books or comic books, it doesn't translate on screen, but this one did. And then I think uh, the atmosphere and the mood of the kind of how dirty and um, you can smell the stuff, you know, you can smell the streets and everything like that. You can see how dirty the characters were. It's something that we drew from. Also, it's good to draw from the comic book because there's not a lot of pictures around from back then that tell you how those people live. And the comic book really, the guy did such great research, you can get um, a lot of information from those. One thing we picked up visually from the book was the squalor in the streets, you know, stuff like that. Also, the uh, horse and carriage shots going uh, through, uh, driving by a topic on landmark, which we use in the, in the movie, too. There's like the Sid Patrick's Needle that was in the comic book. We use that. Um, there's the uh, Christ Church that's in the neighborhood. We use a lot of shots in the comic book for that. The way the girls washed in the um, um, cattle trough. You know, they use it as a bath. We use that in the movie. There's a few other scenes, like sex scenes in the comic book that weren't so graphic in the movie, but they're very graphic in the comic book. And there's this one uh, comic book that's totally dedicated to the, the last murder. And um, every page is how he, you know, chopped this girl's body up with little seeds and stuff like that. So we use a lot of stuff from that, but we didn't use the, the overt direct stuff, but more the, the overall vibe, you know. And there's some shots in there that don't have to do with, like, a lot of bloodletting, so we use that too. This is two of the panels I was discussing as far as like um, one of the things we, we worked off of that shows that something for a graphic novel, it's like a time lapse shot. We used in the, in the, uh, the first murder of Holly Nichols, uh, time lapse motion control shot of like one after the Ripper, it shows the whole shot starts with the Ripper killing her. And then he walks off and disappears, and the moon comes up, and then a cop comes, or constable for that matter. And, <laughs> And then you start to see other constables gather around, and then it becomes this big frenzy of people. And eventually it becomes a suit where you can barely see here, but where like onlookers are there, and then Johnny steps in the scene and plays um, Inspector Abeline, and then just kneels down and shot So this one of the many, many uh, things we took, as well as uh, actually right here, this shot here of Polly in the coach. Um, she's looking out the window and looking at Cleopatra's needle we took this frame also um, so it's little things like that you know I also got that the idea for that shot from um, John Carpenter's Halloween the girl in the car and it was falling on the window something about the window her window too so we had to put her breath up against the window and we put some mist in the book there was, there was a scene um, in the comic book or panels in the comic book of the coachman um, pleasuring himself, I should say. Um, and we shot this, and I shot it almost frame for frame from the comic book. And then we shot his, his murder, too, which he was pleasuring himself before he got murdered. And now uh, both those scenes were cut from the movie because it just didn't work in the movie. But I, was, I loved him from the comic book. Well, this is a perfect example of something I liked that worked in the comic book that just didn't translate the film. The scene unto itself translated. But in the context of the movie, it just didn't work. But it was pretty much frame for frame. I think if you're making a film about based on a novel, that there is a certain amount of responsibility to stay true to the essence of the novel. Um, but at a certain point, as, as we all know, movies take on life their own, and um, you start involving uh, artists and you know, actors and you know whatever, just filmmakers in general, you you don't want to stay true to it in a lot of ways because you want to create this whole new environment. The experience is a whole other experience. If you can put the novel aside and just experience the movie 